All right, welcome back. This is a worked out example of a rotational collision. And the primary physical idea here is the conservation of angular momentum. So let's, uh, let's get started. We'll go back to Newton's second law. And I want to remind you that the rotational form of Newton's second law is that the change in the angular momentum is the net torque times the change in the time. Okay, for some short, for some period of time. And uh, there's a couple of things. First of all, if you have a process that takes place in a very short period of time, then even if there is a small net torque, the approximation that the angular momentum doesn't change can be a reasonable one. And if the net torque is very small, even though the time period is not, you can still claim that the change in the angular momentum is going to be a small quantity. And so uh, the idea is that if, if the angular momentum is, uh, if the change in the angular momentum is small, then you can say that the angular momentum is to some degree or another approximately conserved. Of course, if the net torque is identically zero, um, then the angular momentum is absolutely conserved. So let's, uh, let's look at that and see how it works in an example. So let's say we have a, a wheel that turns on an axle, but the axle is nearly frictionless so that it pr produces very little torque. And uh, if we consider the system to be the wheel plus the projectile, so when the projectile is fired, it's moving at some reasonable speed, it's got angular momentum that's not zero, but the wheel has no angular momentum. During the collision, the wheel is going to exert large amount of force on the projectile as it stops suddenly. The projectile is going to exert a fairly significant force on the wheel um, as it stops suddenly. And each of those forces is going to produce a torque. The projectile is going to produce a torque on the wheel. The wheel is going to produce a torque on the projectile. And these torques are going to be fairly large. So that means that the angular momentum of the projectile is going to change a lot. And the angular momentum of the wheel is going to change a lot. But if you consider the projectile and the wheel both to be part of the system, then the total angular momentum of the system is going to be relatively constant because there's no additional outside force producing torque on the system as a whole. That's the idea. Let's see how that works out. Let's First of all, let's do a little demo. I want you to watch this, look at some graphs, look at some uh, three-dimensional modeling, and see how this goes. OK, so here we have our wheel and the projectile. I'm going to click on the window and start the time. Down in this corner, we're going to have angular velocity as a function of time. And in this corner, we're going to look at angular momentum as a function of time. So let's go ahead and get the thing started. You can watch how it goes. Boom. It happens pretty quickly. And uh, notice that the angular momentum of the projectile starts out high and falls. The angular momentum of the wheel starts out at zero and rises. But the total angular momentum, the blue here, remains constant. Also, the angular velocity of the ball uh, has a funny shape up until it collides with the wheel, and then they both match. The two angular velocities match, and you can see that that's because the ball is stuck to the wheel. So that's the idea. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's see how it works out mathematically. Again, the idea is that the change in the angular momentum is the net torque times the change in time. The only thing that's producing torque on the system as a whole is that axle. And so if we've got it greased up nicely, or if it has nice bearings that produce very little force, then the net torque on the system is going to be very nearly zero. and uh, and the collision also takes place in a very short period of time. So we've got both things going for us. Very little net torque over a very short period of time. So we can, the product of those two small things is going to be exceedingly small. So we can model that as no net angular impulse, and so no change in angular momentum. That means that the final momentum minus the initial momentum is nearly zero, which of course means that the final and initial angular momenta are going to be practically equal to each other. Um, let's look at the initial angular momentum. That's r cross p. r is the vector that goes from the axis of rotation, or the axle of the wheel, out to the position of the projectile. 
And I got to cross that into the momentum of the projectile, which is, of course, it's just its mass times its velocity. But notice that r cross p is nothing other than p times the perpendicular component of r. So let's look at that perpendicular component. That's nothing other than the distance between the axle and the point of impact of the projectile. So what we end up with is r perpendicular times the momentum of the projectile. And I get k hat <clears throat> because if you apply the right-hand rule to r and p, you'll see that you get a k hat that points straight up. You get an angular momentum, r cross p, that points straight up, which is the k hat direction. Finally, the final angular momentum is what you get after the collision has taken place, and the mass has inelastically collided with the fin on the wheel, and that means that the uh, rotational inertia of the projectile is going to be r perpendicular squared times m. I've got to add that to the rotational inertia of the wheel overall to get the total rotational inertia. And to get the final angular momentum, we multiply that by the final angular velocity, omega final. Now, those two have to be equal, so I can solve for omega final. If you, uh, if you do that, you get uh, the following expression. And you can see how it turns out. It depends on the perpendicular distance between the projectile's trajectory and the axle, and it also uh, depends on the mass and initial velocity of the projectile relative to the rotational inertia of the wheel. So let's plug in some numbers and see how it turns out. As you can see, you put in our perpendicular, the mass of the projectile, the speed of the projectile, and you get the final angular velocity. And that's how it works.